Okay, great. Um, are my slides up and everyone hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Okay, yeah. brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, great, it's uh, fantastic uh, to be here, if unfortunately only, only virtually. Uh, I've got a very strong fondness for Singapore. I was actually born in Singapore and went to UWC. So I'm, uh, I, I, I remember uh, walking across, crossing over the uh, Ayaraja Expressway to go to NUS uh, to go running on their running track. So and hopefully, uh, so hopefully soon we'll be back in Singapore at, at, at some point. But uh, right at this exact moment, I'm the exact opposite side of the globe. Um, I mean, I meant that figuratively, but I actually mean quite literally at the moment. I'm in currently located in Barbados, and I think I worked out if I actually start traveling through the center of the planet, I will actually come out pretty much in Singapore. So that being said, um, so we're here for a masterclass in payments and blockchain. And as I said, my name's Matt Hamilton. I'm the principal developer advocate at Ripple. I'm going to talk a little bit about Ripple and about the XRP ledger um, as we go along here. And then we're going to have a bit of an interactive session as part of this. So for anybody who wants to follow along, as part of the workshop here, we're actually going to uh, install and make some payments on the XRP ledger. And to do that, we're going to use a wallet app called Sum. And I've got on the screen here two QR codes, one for uh, iOS, and one for Android. So if you want to follow along, feel free to scan those QR codes now and start downloading. It'll only take a, a, a minute, but um, you might as well do that now. If you want, I'll bring this slide back up later on when we get into the interactive section uh, for people to scan it then and continue on. Okay. So let's start here. So a little bit about Ripple. So Ripple is a company of about 500 employees, nine offices, including um, uh, one in Singapore. And our goal is to enable the ability to move value as easily as you can move information today. So I can live stream video from the International Space Station to my desk. Yet, if I try to make a payment from Singapore to Barbados, it'll probably take about five days. It'll literally be quicker for me to get on a plane with a suitcase full of cash, and in some cases, it may even be cheaper um, to make that payment that way as well. So the goal that Ripple are working on are, is, is to make payments accessible to everyone, uh, accessible everywhere. Now, currently, the average global remittance fee is somewhere around about 6 or 7%. So if you're trying to send money overseas, then you're going to be paying about 6 or 7% in fees. And that disproportionately affects those that most need to be able to do that. And as you're probably aware, especially in Southeast Asia, you have a lot of people moving around, a lot of people working in different countries, sending money home, and this is something that can very much directly affect them. So this is the, the, the thing that um, Ripple are specifically working on. Um, great. Oh, and uh, thanks, Marcus, for putting the, uh, the, the links in the chat there. So I, if anybody has any questions, then put them in the chat, and I'll try and kind of get to them as we, as we go along or, or, or at the end. But feel free to put them in as we, as we go along. So understanding Ripple. So. Ripple is a company, and within Ripple, there are two divisions, RippleNet and RippleX. RippleNet is the payments network that is used typically between banks and is very similar to, you might have heard of SWIFT, uh, which is the uh, international uh, bank network. And RippleNet is kind of a similar uh, concept to SWIFT, but a bit more advanced. The XRP ledger is a blockchain that is used sometimes in part by RippleNet. It's a open source, public, permissionless, decentralized blockchain that allows anybody to move value worldwide. So the relationship is the XRP ledger is you know, public, anybody can use it. Uh, RippleNet is a private network specifically for banks that in part uses the XRP ledger to source liquidity uh, using XRP, which is the digital asset. Uh, that is used on the XRP ledger. 
but anybody can build anything on the XRP ledger. It's completely open. And in fact, the, the SUM app that I um, showed you on, on the slide earlier is from a, a, a third party in the Netherlands called XRPL Labs that are doing a lot of building on the XRP ledger. So a little bit about blockchains. Um, I'm aware that people coming to this talk are probably have different levels of understanding about blockchains and uh, about finance. So blockchains can obviously be used to solve a whole variety of, of issues and different people, different companies, different projects are looking at solving different aspects, whether it be storing medical data and making that more easily accessible, dealing with things like royalties, uh, personal identity, supply chain, tracking, gaming, the area that we're going to be looking at specifically, or the area that Ripple look at specifically, is cross-border payments, as I, as I mentioned. And the XRP ledger is really suited for doing payments. We're going to look at four trends here just to kind of set the scene. So the first is the tokenization of everything. According to the, uh, I believe this is a figure from the World Economic Forum, 10% uh, of global GDP is, protect, is projected to be tokenized by 2027. And there's new forms of value to be tokenized uh, beyond fiat, things like gold, stocks. You've probably heard a lot about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, which are very much in the news a lot at the moment. Um, NFTs are um, tokens that represent things like artwork, property titles, um, uh, items that, that can't simply just be replaced like for like with, uh, with one another, but you can tokenize kind of one-off items and trade them and sell them. There's an explosion in use cases to come. So like I said, you've, you've heard a lot about things like NFTs and artwork. That is one use case. We're very much early in the market. And as with early technologies, it's a case of kind of coming up with a whole suite of applications and really seeing what fits and what works. So there's an opportunity for a very efficient token, um, and that's what XRP is and the XRP ledger, and I'll talk a little bit about its um, specifics as we go on. Trend two is the fragmentation of networks. Um, so there's many specialized networks. There's not going to be one winner takes all. You've no doubt heard of Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP. There's a lot of other uh, blockchains as well and cryptocurrencies out there. And one of the big things is interoperability between them. And Ripple actually started a project called Interledger um, many years ago. It's now part of, it's now a, a, a draft W3C standard that is used to interact between different blockchains, right? And allow you to send value from one to another. In an ideal world, I should be able to send you some value regardless of what blockchain you're on, regardless of what form you want to receive that in. So in the same way that I can send you an email and I don't have to care whether you are on Gmail, whether you're on Microsoft, whether you're on um, you know, an NUS hosted email service, whether it's something you've set up yourself, all I need is your email address. And hopefully we can reach that same kind of ubiquity and interoperability with, with blockchains and cryptocurrencies. The third trend, uh, talking about DeFi. So DeFi is decentralized finance, and it's coming back, it's, it's coming around due to a number of factors. So one is the erosion of institutional trust since the 2008 financial crisis. A lot of people are wanting to kind of do it themselves, right? They want to provide financial services or use financial services without needing to necessarily hand over control to some uh, financial institutional or centralized entity, or they want to be able to pick and choose different services much easier. So they want to get a loan from one area, um, they want to save with another area, and they want to be a lot more kind of piecemeal and be able to pick the best service that fits them, be that in terms of features, be that in terms of user interface um, and experience, for example. And a lot of this is around things like fees, with regards to this. Now, you may have heard a lot about high fees on um, blockchains like Ethereum. The moment if you go to make a transaction on there, you're probably going to be paying about 50 US dollars uh, upwards per transaction, which doesn't really kind of fit into this whole idea of um, cryptocurrencies and blockchains necessarily making things cheaper. But 
there's a lot of other blockchains out there, including things like the XRP Ledger, that are much cheaper and much uh, more efficient. And the, the fourth trend I'm going to talk about is the rise of decentralized exchanges. So at the moment, if you want to trade something, you have to go to a centralized exchange. Now, be that stocks and you have to buy and sell via um, a, a licensed stock exchange or whether that's cryptocurrencies and you're going to the likes of Coinbase or, or Kraken or Bitstamp or whatever it is. Uh, decentralized exchanges allow you to trade directly on the ledger. And that has the advantage that there is nobody that is controlling your funds. You are in control of your funds your, yourself. There's no one that can forbid you access to that. Now, the XRP Ledger was the first blockchain to have a decentralized exchange way back in 2011, 2012, and you know, allows the tokenization of any asset. So on the XRP Ledger, we've not only got the native asset XRP, but also things like US dollars and euros, I'm going to show you in a bit, um, you know, how you can actually go ahead and, and uh, tokenize your own assets on there as well. So I mentioned XRP. XRP is kind of a universal uh, token of value, a universal vehicle of value. You can use it to transfer, um, move value around. So the way in which Ripple are using XRP is as a medium to move that value. So the way Ripple have a product called ODL. And what ODL does is use a local fiat currency in one country, buys XRP with it, sends XRP across to the other side of the world, and then XRP is then sold for local fiat at the other end, right? Um, and, you know, that's one of the use cases of, of, of XRP. So the XRP ledger specifically is very cheap, it's very fast. So a transaction takes you know, a thousandth of a cent. Transactions are confirmed within three seconds. So compare that to the likes of Bitcoin, in which it might be 10 minutes to an hour for a transaction, sometimes longer. And Ethereum, again, you're talking several minutes for a transaction. The XRP ledger transactions are settled in three seconds. The costs significantly lower than most other blockchains. And one of the key things is it's very liquid. It's available on over 100 exchanges and many, many different uh, pairings as well. So if you want to go between different currencies, the chances are you can go uh, from that currency to XRP um, and or back again. So just to recap on a, a couple of its pieces, uh, the XRP ledger, it's, it's the OG DEX, it's the original decentralized exchange um, back in 2012. Like I said, it's very, very liquid. Um, there's a lot of XRP trading about very easily um, compared to a lot of other uh, sort of newer cryptocurrencies. And so companies like Ripple use it to supply liquidity to remittance companies, for example, Tranglo, Nyum, um, Coins, uh, PH in the, in the Philippines do cross-border payments using XRP. It's very fast and it's very interoperable. So a couple of the built-in features of the XRP ledger, kind of getting into a slightly more technical bit here before we get on to kind of the, the workshop. The XRP ledger has the ability to issue assets, what are sometimes called IOUs on the XRP ledger or tokens. So the XRP ledger, like I said, was the first blockchain that allowed the tokenization of assets. And so you can represent anything you want on the XRP ledger. So be that fungible currencies like, you know, dollars, uh, euros, yen, whatever it might be, um, assets such as, or commodities such as gold, for example, oil, you could all be represented uh, in a tokenized form on the XRP ledger. And the XRP ledger allows kind of credit and balance limits to be set as well. So you can say, okay, I will hold these IOUs for um, whatever it might be, uh, gold, but I will only allow up to a certain credit limit on there. And there's some very advanced features as well. Uh, there's a feature called rippling, which is where uh, the, the, the company Ripple gets its name from. And, and the original network was called Ripple to start with, where it gets its name from as well. And that allows you to effectively make payments via a common uh, uh, creditor, right? So if I owe Keith, a uh, hundred dollars 
and Don you owes Keith $100 and I can pay Don by just adjusting how much I owe Keith and uh, Don owes Keith, right? So I can say, okay, I now owe Keith an extra $20 and um, uh, Don owes Keith you know, $20 less and I've effectively paid Don by paying off part of his debt there. So the XRP ledger is the first blockchain to actually kind of acknowledge these debt relationships and actually allow you to model them. So you can actually create some quite interesting uh, financial applications based upon that. And as I mentioned, it's got a decentralized exchange. Unlike some decentralized exchanges on some blockchains that use what's called an automatic market maker, this is actually an order book exchange. So you actually place orders and say, okay, I want to sell um, you know, 100 XRP for 80 US dollars or whatever it might be, or I want to buy um, you know, one Bitcoin for however many Singapore dollars. So you can uh, place and cancel orders on the order books, much like you would do, you know, a centralized exchange like, you know, Coinbase or whatever. And the decentralized exchange is actually used internally within the XRP ledger for cross-asset payments. So one of the great things being is I can say, okay, uh, I want to pay Marcus in, he wants to receive 100 Singapore dollars. I've got euros. Um, I can make the payment and say, hey, pay M Marcus 100 Singapore dollars using the euros in my account. And it will actually use the decentralized exchange and the order books to convert those euros to Singapore dollars as part of that single transaction within three seconds, right? It's, it's a single atomic operation. But what's great is that it will actually find the best route. So the best route might not be to go directly from euros to Singapore dollars, but it might be to go from euros to XRP to Singapore dollars or euros to XRP to US dollars to Bitcoin to Singapore dollars or whatever it might be, the XRP ledger will look across the order books and find the best possible path that will give you the cheapest operation to get the most um, uh, you know, end currency from, from what you're, you're, you're paying with. So that's, that's really pretty cool for, like I said, cross-border payments. That's one of the key use cases that people use um, the XRP ledger for. But again, this could be extended. I talked about NFTs. If you were issuing an NFT on the XRP ledger, this then means that you could accept payment in any currency. So you don't have to say, okay, um, you know, I'm selling this NFT for uh, whatever, a tenth of uh, an Ether. Um, you can set the price and somebody could pay in whatever currency is available on the XRP ledger. So that's kind of a, a, a quick overview, a little bit of the, the, the XRP ledger and some of the functionalities. Now, we're going to get onto the interactive bit here and a bit of a workshop here. So I mentioned at the start about this wallet app called Sum. I've put the QR codes back up here and the links are in the chat as well if you want to click on the links to install um, Sum on your phone. Once you install it, um, it will come up with um, a welcome screen. Now, what I'm actually going to do is I've got my phone here and I am going to share my screen, my phone screen here. So one second here. And if I bring that over, I should be able to do this. And it says, and that's not letting me bring that into this uh, screen. One second here. There we go, right. So I've actually got my uh, phone here on the right. So if we kind of go through this, uh, so the first thing it'll do is it will ask you to set up a passcode on here. Um, I've put in a default passcode. It's actually told me that's not very strong. So I put in something better. So I'm gonna do that. Um, I will, yes, I'll go for face ID on here. There we go. Uh, push notifications. So I'm um, just gonna go through here. So the first thing it'll do is it will walk you through um, just reviewing a few texts to basically say that you understand that this is a um, what's called a non-custodial wallet. So what that means is that this wallet is 
storing your cryptographic keys to access your funds on the XRP ledger. Now, what we're going to do in this demo is we're going to be using what's called the test net. So this is a test network that runs in parallel to the main network. So um, don't worry, we're not going to be using real funds here and you don't have to worry too much at this stage about necessarily um, you know, what you're putting in here because these are all going to be test funds. Obviously, if you use this uh, for real, then you're going to have to be a little more um, careful with things. But what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the process of um, look, uh, connecting up a test account to this wallet. So like I said, feel free to uh, follow along with me because what we're going to do is we're going to actually send live send payments. So what I will do is I will bring up the chat and we'll be able to send uh, payments back and back and forth. So see here, get to the end here. And right, okay, so we've got some bit here that just kind of says uh, what's new in the latest release. So I'm gonna close that. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is add an account. So I'm going to tap add account and I'm going to import an existing account. So um, Right here, I'm going to choose full access. And I'm going to choose here family seed, the middle option here. And click next. And it's going to come up and say enter in the family seed. So what we're going to do is we're going to import in a uh, test account. And there's a service called a testnet faucet. Now, testnet faucet is a service that will create an account for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up my camera here and just scan that QR code and open it. And this will take me to this testnet faucet. And if you scroll down, you'll see two buttons here and you want generate testnet credentials. So if I tap on that, it's going to generate some keys for me. Now, you have two parts of keys here. You've got the public part, the address, which is the one that starts with R, and the secret, which starts with S. Now, the secret key is the bit that you want to keep private and you want nobody else to see, and you definitely don't want to be broadcasting it on a live show to everybody. However, this is the test net, so this is not real funds, so it's, it's okay for me to um, kind of be doing that. Now, uh, oh, I've just noticed a mistake here. I've highlighted the address here. That's not the bit you need to copy. It's actually the secret. It's the lower, the lower down one. Um, so sorry, I just realized I got that wrong there. But that's the bit that you want. You want to copy the secret. So if you copy that and then go back to um, some app, then you can paste that into there, right? Now, hopefully people, if people are following along here, I'll just give you a second here. Hopefully people are following along. So if I do that, say next, it'll say, please confirm the public address. And that's the, uh, the, the, the public address that was shown earlier, because there's a mathematical relationship between the secret address and the, and the public address. Uh, so it's able to derive that. So I'll just leave this testnet faucet QR code up. Um, a second here. People. Right. Uh, so activation. So every account on the XRP ledger needs a certain balance to activate it, right? At the moment, that is 10 XRP. It used to be 20 XRP, it's now 10 XRP, but this is kind of a deposit uh, that is kept in the account. Now you can see this faucet here has generated a thousand XRP. And like I said, this is not real XRP. This is just test XRP on the test network here. Um, so, but the deposit, it tells you here that you need a deposit of at least 10 XRP. And so because the account has been pre-funded because it's a test account, uh, you will have that in there. So I'm just gonna go for standard security next. Um, you can give it a label whatever you want to call it, I'm just going to call it test. Next. And it is complete, right. And it tells us our account is not activated. 
for the moment and we will fix that in a second. So hopefully people are following along here. If anybody has any um, uh, issues here, then put in the chat, but hopefully people are able to kind of come along here. So the next step, it says our account's not activated. Now it is activated, but some by default is looking at the main network. We need to switch it so it's looking at the test network, which is where our account is. So if you tap on the bottom right on the settings, little settings gear down at the bottom, and then advanced, and when that comes up, uh, you want to tap on node at the top there. And you want to change that to the testnet. So you can just pick that first one, testnet.xrplabs.com. Are you sure you want to switch? Yes. Um, so do that. And if I go back and back and go to tap on home, you will see hopefully now that you have a balance here. So it's 990 XRP. So remember, it funded it with 1,000. There's 10 required for a deposit, so it's showing you what's available here, which is 990 XRP. So hopefully people have got to this stage here. Now, if you've got to this stage successfully, then feel free to copy the um, uh, code, uh, the, the address now, just realize that you're going to try and copy that address you might not be able to paste it into the chat here because the chances are um, you are operating on a phone and the the app on the phone and you're watching this stream on your laptop if you do have a shared clipboard uh, you can copy that i know that people might not necessarily have that set up um, there but if you go tap on the address at the top tap copy you can copy that and paste it into the chat and I will be able to send a payment to you. Ah, great. So we've got one person in here that's done that. So I can now copy that. If I copy that uh, from the chat, I can then go into my app and I can send and I can send say 10 XRP. I say next and I put in the address. Now this is the address that I have just seen from, from the chat here. Turn next and slide to send it. And it'll ask for your pin, thumbprint, face ID. Um, and that has been sent. So hopefully, uh, is that uh, Reshma? Yes, Matt, um, I Reshma received it. will have received. Fantastic. Great. Thank um, you. Uh, yeah, no problem. So, and I'll do, do one more, uh, Alvina. So let's see here if I go here and send and say send. And I'm going to send as well 10 XRP, paste in there. So it's Alvina's address. Next, send that. And so hopefully Alvina will receive that um, in a few seconds. And similarly, if I want somebody to send to me, if I hit request here, it'll bring up a QR code. So again, if anybody's watching, then feel free to scan that QR code. So what you do in sum is if you on the home screen, screen down in the bottom, there's the middle icon that says um, uh, uh, sum down here, this X and a tick in the center. If you tap on that, you can select QR code and you can bring up and you'll be able to uh, bring up the camera and scan this QR code and you'll be able to then uh, send a um, payment to myself, right? And if anybody um, happens to do that, then it will show up on my phone as well. I think I've actually got do not I'd, disturb. I've sent you 10. Oh, You've exactly. sent me 10? Okay. Yep. Oh, thank you. So if I click, there we go. So you can see it here and I can actually see the, uh, if I tap on events here, I can see the transactions. So there we go. So I've had three payments come in, 123 XRP, 10 XRP, 10 XRP. So there we go. So this is the, this is some, this is the XRP ledger. And you can see just how quick it is to make these payments. And each one of these transactions is 
you know, it's about a thousandth of a cent. It's 10, the default fee is 10 drops. So within XRP, so you have within each one XRP, you've got a million drops. That's the kind of the, the, the smaller um, subdivision currency uh, drops. And it's 10 drops to send a payment. So it really is a very small amount there. And as you can see, you know, it's very fast. I wouldn't be able to live demo this on something like Ethereum or Bitcoin because we'd still be waiting for the transactions uh, to come through. So there we go. You can see the transactions actually going through um, real time, which is great. So the next thing I'm going to show, and feel free to you know play around with this yourself. Like I said, this is test XRP. You can send stuff back and forwards to each other. Um, you can uh, send the link or addresses um, back and forwards. There's other things you can do on here as well. There's things like uh, address books in here as well. So you can actually um, go in here. You can return a payment and uh, you can put in memos in here, for example. Uh, there's even like an address book as well. You can you can uh, put people in like an address book as well there. So let me just go through my notes here. Uh, Testnet faucet, we've done that, done payments. Great, so the next thing I'm going to show is how you can interact with this with code, because that's great being able to do it through the app. And that can hopefully show you how nice and uh, easy it is to do uh, payments through uh, an app like Sum. And Sum is just one wallet app. There's a number of wallets out there that support XRP as well. Just Sum is uh, probably the, the, the best one, I would say, for this. Now, um, I'm going to switch over to some code. So one second here. I'll just rearrange some windows here a second. He says, I've got the, I need to just move this one out of the way. There we go. And just move this over here so we can see it still. Right, okay, so on the left here, I've got some Python code. There's various ways you can interact with the XRP ledger. Uh, you can use JavaScript, you can use Python, you can use Java, you can connect directly via XML RPC or WebSockets to, to make connections there um, with that. I'm using Python because Python's a very uh, kind of high level, quite easy language. And so I can actually describe this and hopefully, so even as a programmer, hopefully you can take a little bit away from this. So what we're doing here. So first of all, we import a number of functions and utilities from the library XRPL Pi. So there's a, a client library XRPL Pi for Python, XRPL JS for JavaScript, and XRPL 4J for, for Java. And I'm going to be connecting to the testnet. So here I've got the address of the testnet. Now it's a slightly different address to what you had in um, some, but it's the same network, right? But it's just showing a different different host there. This is one that's hosted by by Ripple. And I want to send a payment. So I need an address here, a, a wallet secret key to send. So that's the one that starts with an, an S because that's a secret. I need to sign a transaction and I need the receiving address, which is this one here. And I think, let me just double check and see if I've got the right one. Is this my address here? No, I've generated a new one here. So one second, let me just copy this. I'll copy that there. Um, I can paste that in here. There we go, it's the same address, ends in 4D, there we go. And I can send an amount um, here as well. So I'm gonna send 23 XRP, or there we go. let's go 88 XRP. Um, I instantiate a wallet there using the sender's wallet key. I'm just gonna print out that it's sending and receiving. I construct the transaction and it's a payment transaction. It's going from the sending wallet's address. I've had to convert the amount into drops because the API uses that smaller um, uh, denomination drops there. So it doesn't have to deal with decimals. The destination is the receiving address, which I've set here, which is my address in, in sum and the fee, which is 10 drops. I then need to sign the transaction. So that's signed using the sending wallet um, that we, we've defined there. And 
we send it. So this is a function here that will connect to the XRP ledger, send the trans, wait the three seconds for it to come through and then return the end there. So let's run this then. So if I um, do it here, I should be able to do Python. Um, uh, was it simple payment? There we go. So if I send that, uh, sending and receiving, and hopefully what you should see is you should see it pop up in my sum wallet when that goes through. There we go, XRP. it's just popped up. So it's actually gone through there. And so that's just a demo of using code to actually send it. So that's how easy it is if you want to integrate in the XRP ledger to your own applications. That's just an example of doing a payment. Now, like I said, you can do a lot of other things with the XRP ledger because you can actually trade using the decentralized exchange. You can make cross-currency payments. There's a lot of different things that you can do there. Now, I mentioned tokens. And one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to issue Singapore dollars on the XRP ledger. So this is you know, simulating that I might be a financial institution and I want to tokenize Singapore dollars. So the idea would be that somebody would deposit Singapore dollars with me and in return, I would um, give them tokens on the XRP ledger that represents that. So if you deposited 100 Singapore dollars, I give you 100 you know, tokens that represent Singapore dollars on the XRP ledger. Now, this code's a little bit um, uh, a little bit longer, but I'm, I'm, so I'm not going to go into the full details of it, but just to say that you have effectively a cold wallet and a hot wallet. The cold wallet is the issuer of the asset. The hot wallet is the kind of the, the operational wallet. Sorry, is there somebody there in the chat? No? Okay. Um, I can configure the uh, account here and I'm going to uh, set a uh, configure both the, the cold and the hot wallet addresses. And I'm going to create what's called a trust line for Singapore dollars. Uh, and this is what's going to actually issue these Singapore dollars. So I'm going to um, uh, uh, issue that. And I'm going to say up to is that a million, billion, 10 billion. Um, and I'm going to actually issue 3,840 arbitrary chosen number uh, Singapore dollars, right? Uh, similarly, I sign and send the transaction. So like I said, I'm not going to go into the full details here, but I will run this. Or oh, let me just double check that the um, uh, hot wallet address here, I think this is all correct. I may have already run this. So let's, uh, um, I think I've already run this. So what I will do is I will actually move on to the, the next one, because if I run this again, it'll probably fail. But what I can do is I can, once I've completed that, I can actually pay Singapore dollars. Now I need to set up a this, this trust line here. So let's um, see here the destination address. I need the secret to this account here. Um, and that will be whether this is the correct one or not. Let me just double check here. Uh, I can't remember whether I noted the secret down before I did this uh, when I created this account. Let me just quickly go back to the, oh no, it was on the phone, wasn't it? Let me just check here. If I go back to Safari, here we go. I've got the uh, address here, the secret. Um, so I just need to copy that. It ends in 65. So let me just copy that and paste that here. No, that's not the right thing. Try that again. Copy. For some reason, that is not copying and pasting that through in there. Um, and I'm not going to type that all out because that's going to take a take a while to type that all in there. Uh, oh, let's let me do it quickly then, uh, just uh, quickly because this is quite good to show because um, it will show how you can actually um, create currencies and issue them on the XRP ledger, and I'll be able to then send people. Um, Singapore dollars, if we have enough time, we may not do. Right. 
Okay, let's run this then. Hey, SGD. Now, if I go back to my sum wallet, go back to the home there, right. Let's try that then. The demo, demo gods are smiling on me, hopefully. So what this is doing is first of all, it's setting this, uh, there we go, it's set the, the, the trust line. So it says I can hold Singapore dollars. So I've, I've, I've done that. And now it's now sending 60 Singapore dollars to my account. And there we go, 60 Singapore dollars. So I now have Singapore dollars in this account as well. And I could, like I said, I can pay with Singapore dollars. I could transfer those to somebody else um, or I could use the, the decentralized exchange um, to exchange them. Let's bring up the, uh, the chat here. So somebody's asking, uh, CK is asking whether uh, the XRP ledger's underlying building language is Python, as in Ethereum is using Solidity. So there's various languages you can use to interact with the XRP ledger, Python, JavaScript, or Java. This is, those are the languages you're using to write code to interact with the XRP ledger. This is not running like a smart contract on the XRP ledger. So the XRP ledger at the moment doesn't have on-chain smart contract functionality. The reason being is that most of the functionality you need smart contracts for is actually natively built into the XRP ledger. So all of what we've done, what I've just showed you in terms of issuing your own currency is a native function on the XRP ledger. If you were doing that on Ethereum, you would need a smart contract to create what's called an ERC-20 token. But the XRP ledger has built in things like uh, tokenization, a decentralized exchange, um, escrow functions, multi-signature functions, all those things are built in natively. So you don't need um, uh, you, you don't need smart contracts to do that. That said, there is a um, thing called hooks that is being worked on at the moment that will allow um, arbitrary kind of smart contract functionality on the XRP ledger. So that's the kind of demo bit um, done here. How are we doing for time here? Okay, 45, okay. So I'm now gonna talk just a little bit about uh, kind of the sustainability and impact of the XRP ledger. As I mentioned at the start, one of the great things with the XRP ledger is it uses much less um, energy than the likes of Bitcoin. And this was designed right at the start. So the XRP ledger was actually created by three Bitcoin developers back in 2011 who saw the issue with proof of work, which is a consensus mechanism that Bitcoin uses. Um, they saw the energy requirements um, even 10 years ago. And obviously it's a, it's, it's a much greater energy requirement now. And so they sought to create something that would be as decentralized as Bitcoin, but without the energy requirements. And they came up with the um, XRP ledger consensus protocol and created uh, the XRP ledger and said, so the XRP ledger uses, like I said, this more efficient consensus mechanism rather than proof of work that uh, say Bitcoin and, and Ethereum use at the moment. And kind of putting the numbers on that. Uh, so Bitcoin, as of March earlier this year, uh, Bitcoin was using about as much power as the entire country of, of Portugal. You've probably seen a lot of kind of this kind of sort of comparisons, uh, whereas the XRP ledger is a, is a tiny, tiny fraction of that. Um, in there. I mean, even if you compare to something like cash, cash still uses a fair amount of energy when you factor in all the processing of it as well in there. And then if we compare it to other cryptocurrencies and actually sort of look at the numbers, um, comparing it in sort of various ways, uh, one of the easiest ways to kind of visualize it is things like gallons of, of gas. So about 75 gallons of gas per transaction for a Bitcoin transaction, 2.3 gallons of gas per transaction for an Ethereum transaction, whereas we're talking um, 63 thousandths of an address of, of, of a gallon. Um, so 63 thousandths, yeah. Um, uh, of, or even less than that, 63 ten thousandths of a, of, of a gallon uh, per transaction on the XRP ledger. So a lot more efficient. And as a result of that, a lot less CO2 emissions. So one of the, uh, the XRP ledger was the first major blockchain to become carbon neutral. So it has very little emissions anyway, 
Um, but then the XRP Ledger Foundation has actually bought you know, carbon credits to offset the very small amount of energy that it does use. Um, and so it's actually uh, carbon neutral. And Ripple and the XRP Ledger Foundation have been working with an organization called Energy Web to actually kind of look at the energy requirements of cryptocurrencies and blockchains. And this, again, going back to, uh, you know, one of the sort of topics of, of, of currently of the day, a lot of people talk about NFTs. This is a, obviously a very uh, pertinent uh, thing with, with NFTs because a lot of, say, artists are looking at minting NFTs. And I, I actually saw one comment from one saying, well, I might as well just go and burn down a rainforest instead. And, you know, the, 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 the thought was that there's so much carbon emission from doing things like, you know, issuing an NFT on the XRP, on, on something like Ethereum. Whereas if you do something like that on XRP, on the XRP ledger, it's much less energy usage. So how can XRP drive greater financial inclusion? Um, as I mentioned right at the very start, the cost of things like cross-border payments, the cost of accessing financial services can be very expensive for some people. And the ability to um, use XRP in that way can actually have quite a dramatic effect on you know, people's lives and their, their, their livelihoods. And not only that, but it kind of changes the whole way in which transactions can occur. So we've talked a bit about remittances. I've talked a bit about DeFi, small payments. If you're going to send some money home and you're going to use the likes of Western Union or something like that, and you want to send $10 um, home, and it's costing you $5 per transaction, you're not going to do that. You're going to wait until you've saved up $100 and make that. Um, if you are wanting to accept payments. So think about things like um, a newspaper website, right? You've probably come across newspaper websites or magazine websites, information websites that have some kind of paywall. And you have to put in your credit card and subscribe for some sort of monthly subscription. Well, the reason they have to do that monthly subscription is because it's not economical for them to take a credit card payment for less than, say, five or ten dollars. Right. They can't take a credit card payment for ten cents to allow you to read that article, that one article, because the cost of the transaction is so much higher, right? You're going to be paying 50 cents or whatever it is per, per transaction for a, uh, a debit card you know, transaction. So with the XRP ledger, because the transaction fees are so low, you can actually come up with completely different business models. So for example, there's a company called Coil that are actually doing streaming micropayments. So as you are reading a blog post or watching a video, your browser is sending payment to that content creator, literally, every few seconds, right? So every few seconds, it is sending, you know, a thousandth of a cent or whatever it is, however much it is to the, to the content creator. When you stop, it stops, right? So you're really just paying the, um, the kind of exact amount for what you're using. And that means that you don't have to, you know, take a credit card payment, which means you don't have to take their address in order to verify the credit card payment. You don't have to uh, have them create a username and a password such they can come back to their account to use the credit that they've paid for, right? All of those kind of things go away when you can just literally pay as you go along, because as soon as the payment comes in, you can um, issue the, 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 the currency there or the, the, the service. So the opportunity around digital payments are accelerating. Um, You've probably seen now this is a you know a great trend. It goes back to the trends I mentioned at the start that the you know cryptocurrencies are growing, they're being adopted in, in, in wider contexts within fintech, beyond fintech as well. And they really have the opportunity to kind of foster financial inclusion uh, for people. So that's kind of what I want to leave you with is that's kind of the goal that we're aiming for here. And the end is hopefully building better financial services, more equitable financial services, more affordable financial services to everybody across the globe. So thank you very much uh, for your time. And my you know, contact details are there if anybody has any, you know, wants to reach out at all. But I'm happy to take some questions now. I see we've got a question in uh, the chat as well here. Uh, so CK asks, 
Uh, how do we measure energy requirements and carbon impact of XRP or any DLT? Are there any instruments, programming language? So it's, uh, or is it from the company's monthly utility bills? Yes, effectively it's from utility bills. So in the case of the XRP ledger, you can work out, okay, how many uh, nodes are there on the network that are running? Uh, what is the power consumption per node on average? and work it out based upon that way. So yes, it is an approximation, but it's possible to do that. With things like proof of work networks, uh, they use a lot more power, but again, you can kind of look at the, um, what's called the hash rate that they're producing. And from the hash rate, you calculate backwards to the amount of energy consumed. And then from there, you can calculate, you know, uh, emissions or cost uh, based upon that. There's a move to, move to, to, to greener energy sources for things like proof of work. Uh, the main problem with that being is that proof of work, by its very definition, the way in which it works is proof of work requires energy to be scarce, right? Proof of work works by basically introducing an artificial scarcity around energy. Now, energy obviously is scarce within certain parameters, it is finite. But if you then start using renewable energies, you start making energy, uh, you start saying, okay, well, I've got a cheaper form of energy or more available form of energy to use for, for, for say, Bitcoin mining. Um, all that Bitcoin will do is increase the difficulty level such that it consumes more power, right? So uh, it doesn't really matter that you're finding more greener energy because all that happens is Bitcoin will just consume that. And that's then energy that's not necessarily available for, for other um, sources as well. So there we go. Right. Um, any further questions? If anybody has any questions, feel free to, to, to put in the chat or, or come off mute. CK asks, roughly how much is Ripple's monthly electricity cost? Is okay to share here. So it's not Ripple's cost, it's the, the, the XRP ledger um, as a whole. So the XRP ledger, I can let me just um, bring up here if I just. Um, Oh, no, live net. Uh, sorry, live net. Here we go, network here. So here is a uh, kind of uh, map showing the nodes on the XRP ledger. Um, there's over 800 nodes on there, and it kind of shows the status kind of of them um, on, the, on the network there. So uh, from there, you can basically try and in, in, infer the, the, the costs and the, the energy usage uh, from, from there. So I don't know what the full amount is. There's a, um, like I said, there's an, a, a, well, if you go to ripple.com slash impact, uh, it's impact, I think it's impact. No. Uh, we have actually, um, done some stuff here. Oh, okay, here we go. So it's on not on Ripple site, it's on the XRP Ledger site. So there's a couple of um, sites here. So if I put in this here into the chat, then um, if anybody wants to find out more, um, xrpl.org. And there's actually a tool here, there's a carbon calculator on here um, you can go into that gives you a lot more information there and you can actually calculate it for yourself there. So I'll put a link there to that. And, and this site here, this um, xrpl.org has a lot more information about the XRP ledger, how you can access it, how you can get involved in, in the community if you want to, uh, the features of the XRP ledger, and it's got all the documentations for development. So talk about, like I said, languages, we've got um, uh, SDKs there. And you can go into these, and there's actually some tutorials in there as well that you could you can follow along with. So, the code that I ran earlier for issuing a, a token um, actually came from a tutorial we have here: uh, issue a fungible token, and that tutorial kind of takes you through all the steps there in different languages. So, I think there's possibly a question coming from Glenn here. It just says, "Dear Matt." Um, Alex Limbs, uh, why doesn't XRP have smart contracts? So this was a design, design decision at the start. So the XRP ledger was the second major blockchain after Bitcoin. Um, it came about three or four years before Ethereum did, and really before the whole idea of smart contracts had taken off. Uh, in fact, the creator of Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin, 
actually interned at Ripple um, several years before he actually created Ethereum and, and, and smart contracts. Now, uh, Ripple actually went down the approach of creating off-chain smart contracts. So they were working on a project uh, called Codius and Codius was a smart contract um, system that runs um, off-ledger. So the idea was that uh, the designers of, of, of Codius uh, didn't want smart contracts to be so directly tied to the ledger because that meant only one ledger could use them. So Codius is actually connected to uh, Interledger, which I mentioned before. So Interledger is, it was a standard that was created by Ripple. It's now its own separate thing as the Interledger Foundation. And Interledger is a network to, in, on a standard for interconnecting different blockchains, right? And Codius connects to Interledger. So the idea was that it would be agnostic to whatever blockchain you wanted to use. And that's the way they, they, they kind of created it. And it's a bit more flexible. However, on-chain transactions like those on Ethereum have certainly gained a lot more popularity. People have been interacting with them a lot more. Um, but I mentioned there's a, a system called Hooks um, and Hooks is being developed uh, by a group in the Netherlands called XRPL Labs, actually the same people that created the Sum wallet that I was, I was demoing earlier. And um, uh, Hooks allows you to create bits of code that will function on when, when a transaction is received by an account. So you could do things like say, okay, whenever any payment comes into this account, take 1% of that, uh, those incoming funds and send it off to this charity, for example, or uh, don't accept any payments, deny any payments that are less than a certain value, for example, right? So you can, you can create different um, uh, functions there that will run in a similar way to smart contracts. So they're going to be coming soon. Uh, there's a test net, so you can play around with them. Um, and they'll be on the um, main XRP ledger, hopefully sometime next year, has to be voted on by the, by the, by the participants of the network. Uh, so Glenn asks, uh, can the Ripple be used as a form of Forex, for example, sending uh, from a wallet uh, W Singapore dollars and receiving it another? Yes. Um, so yes, you can use uh, issued assets on there. So I issued Singapore dollars on there. There's US dollars, there's euros, um, et cetera, on the XRP ledger. So you could use the XRP ledger directly for fiat currencies, right? You could create a fiat currency, you know, remittance system on the XRP ledger, and no one would even necessarily know that you're using um, cryptocurrencies. They wouldn't have to have any interaction with cryptocurrencies. As far as they're concerned, they're using Singapore dollars and are able to make payments in US dollars or, or euros or whatever they want um, in there. They don't have to use cryptocurrencies because you can pretty much tokenize anything. So we're out of time. Um, if anybody has any more questions, then uh, feel free uh, to get a hold of me. Uh, my contact details, I'll put my email address here in the chat. Um, and you can get me on Twitter uh, there as well. So once again, thank you very much for having me. Matt, uh, Matt, uh, that was a great session. Before we conclude this session, can we have a picture together? Everyone yeah. can switch on their camera. That'd be great. Should I stop can sharing? Everyone, can everyone turn on your camera? Let's have a photo together with Matt. Okay. If I stop sharing, that make that easier. Is okay, everyone following? Picture? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. No, it's okay, bro. Yeah, thank you. You took the picture already? I, I'm not taking it. I'm not at my desk. Uh, I'll take, I'll take, okay. Thank you. Count, just count down. Five. One, two, and go. All right. One more. Okay. Got it. Next page, one more. <laughs> take your time, this one. No, don't take your time. Yes, yes, done. done. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Thank time. you, Matt. Thank, Thank you. you. Really appreciate right. it.
No problem. Thanks a lot, all. And um, yeah, hopefully see you in Singapore maybe sometime next year. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Bye. 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 Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us in these sessions. Hope to see you all again in for tomorrow's sessions. Yeah, today's session um, is over. So tomorrow there's still more. Do you want to flash um day three? Uh yeah, let me let me flash the let Getty show you um some of the exciting uh active um events that we have coming up tomorrow. So we hope you will join us as well. So this is for tomorrow. Tomorrow is slightly a bit uh a bit lighter. But after tomorrow, we will have a more session coming up on day four, especially on the morning sessions, three imagining innovation. We have about nine speakers for the morning sessions. So hope you all can join us for the rest of the week from tomorrow, Thursday and Friday. All right, if there's nothing, you all can um, drop off the call and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining bye -bye. us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.